Hello, hello. Hello, hello. How's it going? Hi, all. Looks like the intro doesn't want to leave the conversation. No, it's like, no, please keep me. You always kick me out. Please keep me. (laughs) He doesn't have much to say other than that music he sings at the beginning of the conversation. Still a great music, though. All right. (laughs) This is a great topic. I'll let you introduce it. Alyssa, you're back, but... We're, yes. we're throwing in a twist in re- true marketing fashion. We're not going to directly address marketing. It might pop up into the conversation, but we are not. So um, we wanted to talk about uh, what, I've, what I've taken the liberty to press to baptize sales process and client management. And so uh, my understanding is kind of like in lay people's term, I guess, would be like what happens when sales opportunities or whatever come in uh, through other groups, right? And, and and my guess is often related to existing clients, right? Like uh, we're not talking about like, hey, Bob was walking down the street and found a potential client. It's it's um, it's more we're working with an existing client. They get transferred over to ops, or you have a customer success team that takes care of them. And what happens with opportunities that come through that door? Did I summarize that properly? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Sounds good. So we're let's start. So we're oh, we always talked a little bit offline before we start. So Alyssa, what I find really fascinating, and I find you summarized it really well, but I'll let you expand on it. How and you said it really well. What happens when sales or sales opportunities or 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 opportunities come in through the non-traditional channel, which is you know operations or whatever customer service or whatever it might be? Is that a good way to summarize it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I think it's thinking about the whole customer journey and where sales can drop in at any time. And so what do you do as an organization in that regard? Do you make black and white rules where like anything that's a new job directly has to go back to sales? Probably not the best idea to do that. Um, or do you, to your point, Paul, that you brought to play was, you know, everyone is a sales agent in some ways. Anyone who connects directly with a client is. So at what point do you decide what projects go through that operations channel or that customer service channel where there is a sales opportunity that lands on someone's plate and they need to act on it fast and to what and at what point do you push it back to the core sales team to manage handle lockdown yeah it's more of a question for discussion for us in general i don't know if i have an answer it came from a direct um scenario that i was working through in a workshop with with clients um and they had a lot of their re um you know new production runs existing business uh with new with existing clients but but a new project coming through their engineering team Mm -hmm. and when you think about engineers they're more tech oriented yeah they're taking the details of the project but you know are they really equipped to upsell or to adjust or to take on new projects, even though those are coming directly to them. So at what point do you pass it back to sales? That, that's, I think that's a really fascinating question. And if I can speak anecdotally to two clients who uh, have quite, well, one of them has a simpler product, but one of them has a very complex scientific pro- product. And, and a lot of the selling um, would happen when a scientist would be discussing with a potential client. So what that client decided to do is say, well, I'm, I'm going to literally teach my scientists how to properly handle a sale. It, it's not to necessarily how to sell, but how to ask questions so that the client, it, so that the conversation stays client focused and it doesn't zoom into a scientific discussion of the scientist trying to push something that they believe in. But first, um, it has to be a discussion about them understanding business objectives and, and mm. the client's objectives. So I guess what I'm saying in a very roundabout way is I believe, you know, anyone and everyone who talks to a client or can have an effect on an eventual sale is in in, in essence a little bit in the sales department and should understand what a sales process is, even though there won't be prospecting necessarily, but they need to understand, I think, within that whole sales process, or as you said earlier, the buyer's journey, what's going on and what are we actually dealing with at the sales or buyer's journey level, not just the science of what I'm trying to to do. I don't know. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, uh, I think you're right. I think, I mean, obviously with any of the things that we talked about is obviously 
very company dependent, right? I mean, yeah. I've seen the flip side too, right? Where we're trying to transform groups of people who are ultimately not salespeople, not comfortable having these conversations mm-hmm. into sales agents and frankly, just exploding, right? It just didn't work. It, it was clunky. It was difficult. Uh, the numbers weren't there. And, and granted, they weren't working with you, Paul. So maybe that was fundamentally the issue. Um, but, you know, I, I think you also need to be aware of who you're talking to and, and are, they, are they equipped to be able to do it, right? It's one thing, and I, Paul, as you know, right, you run a lot of coaching and training and, and whatnot and not, you know, sales, some sales concepts like asking open-ended questions and all that are, are hard to adopt by a seasoned salesperson. Like forget about, you know, I'm picking on engineers because we talked about engineers. Forget about an engineer, right, who lives in a world of, of zeros and ones and, and factual, factual realities. So I think you, as a company, you also need to be aware of, of who the team is and what the client's expectations are. Because you could also argue that, and, and HubSpot does this, you know, for as much as I like HubSpot, but sometimes you reach out to customer support and they're like, oh, well, that's not on you. I mean, to transfer you to sales. And then they try to say, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa it's okay. I don't yeah. know. You know what I mean? Like, so I, I think you just need to be, uh, can't forget that element too, right? That there are humans at the end of the day that, and some are, some became engineers because they didn't want to go into sales. So then don't tell me now that I have to start selling, right? And, and stuff like that. But right. you see, that, 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 that was, that's interesting, Fab, because to me, um, an engineer, let's say, let, let's, let, let's make this tactical for a second. Let's say an engineer sells uh, a, a, a service or a, a complex widget, like they're making a parts that go into to airplanes, right? And the, and, and the, the airplane manufacturer is having a conversation with this engineer. The engineer might not be a salesperson, but she is probably very proud of the product that she has. And she probably has a solution in her mind. Well, okay, you have this uh, objective and we have this problem, but it's not about so much about how can I get them to buy my thing, but how can I ensure that I'm having a conversation that is client focused? It's no mm-hmm. longer just two people speaking. It's they're the client and you're the supplier. And if you're the supplier, you need to always, you know, the, the, the most important thing is the client has an objective because that client will be paying you to solve that objective. So that engineer, that scientist always has to have that in mind. It's not just two peers speaking to each other at a, at a wedding. It's I'm trying to help you solve something. And you know you're my you're my uh, you're my client uh, you're my client you're paying me you're you're putting bread and butter on my plate so my job as an expert is to help you achieve your objective. That to me is where you become part of the sales team because you're helping your company move forward. You're not just some some genius engineer who's trying to tell everyone how great they are about how they can do their solution. You're actually thinking of that that objective now to me how do you how do you take all that sort of you know high level uh strategy and then how do you boil that down and this is what i, I want um, i want Alyssa to talk to us about what she's done how do you boil that down into a sales process that is respected by everyone regardless of where you are in the company yeah mm-hmm. totally and that's the thing that I'm, I'm putting my um business owner hat on right now when i think about that dilemma so you know, you're the owner of a mid-sized organization. You're from a from a boss or business operating system perspective. You're the integrator, the visionary, the CEO, the GM, the owner of your company. What do you need to do then to map that out? And to Fab's point, every business is a snowflake, a hundred percent. And I don't say that facetiously; it's entirely true. There's no black or white way or to go about doing this. But it is important for business owners and leaders to map out what their snowflake looks like. You should know the geographic patterns of your snowflake, right? Don't just hope for the best. And so, so yes, it's a snowflake, but you still need to map it out. You still need to have a sense of what it is. You need to be able to recreate the snowflake in different places. If you're the owner, I asked you, what does your snowflake look like? As an owner, you should be able to draw it out for me. And that's where processes within the organization being defined and actually written down and discussed and agreed upon is essential. So that's first and foremost, once you have a process of how it works, you can see, oh, what's going on, right? And it wasn't until we did this sales process with my client that we realized a lot of our 
the majority of our business is actually coming through existing clients with new yeah. projects to our engineering team. Yeah. And very little of our business yeah. is coming from our sales uh, shark team looking out for new business opportunities. Yeah. So yeah. it wasn't until we did that exercise that we realized, oh, okay, there's something funny happening here that we need to at least map out or figure out. And then the other point to your to your point, Paul, I think it's as a as a leader, it's helping everyone in the organization, especially those important individuals that are having touch points with clients, to understanding the ability to recognize an opportunity. So what is an opportunity? What does a sales opportunity look like? So they can at least see it. And also how, as a team, we qualify that opportunity. So defining what qualification does an opportunity have when it goes back to sales? Yeah. At what point? And, and it gives that engineer the expertise and the capability to recognize an opportunity and to qualify it as something I can handle or I should pass it off to someone else or bring someone else in to handle it with me. And once you define that, it makes it, I think, a lot easier for people to kind of know what their job is and what their role and responsibility is in terms of. Absolutely. And, and, and Fab, if you let me just interject before you jump in, um, the, the, there's a stigma to sales and I want to talk about it quickly. So, so a little parentheses, there's a stigma to sales. A lot of people who are outside of sales don't want to be part of sales because they figure, oh, that's like the, you know, <laughs> they think of a sleazy lawyer or a used car salesman, but really if you if we redefine sales process and what it really means it's it's about helping your clients so you you play a uh, you play a role in that and you're, you're right Alyssa that if you map out that sales process so let's say regardless of who's doing it forget forget the individuals forget the sales department forget operations what's going on in a sales process forget the individual what's going on what do you need to do to match that sales process with with the buyer's journey so what are you what is being said forget what are you what is being said and what is being felt by the buyer so what is being said by the organization to give comfort to the buyer to move through and what you just said is sort of an account management situation so i'm getting i forget who they're coming into but they're coming into the company with a request so which part of the sales process are they in? What's going on in the buyer's journey? And then what you need to, to, to decide, and you're totally right, uh, uh, Alyssa, is <clears throat> who's best, who's, who's got the best knowledge to address the questions and the situation to make that sales process uh, happen or, or, or to, make, to, to create fluidity in the sales process so that you can give your client and you can serve your client properly to get what they want. So forget titles, forget what department you're in, who's the best person who knows the information to walk that through. So maybe you do need a, an engineer and a salesperson because the salesperson knows all of the ins and outs and the questions to ask. And the engineer is there as a really a product expert of your company to make sure they go together. Or maybe the engineer can handle a little part of it because he has a, he, he or she has a, a uh, um, um, a, a communication with that client that permits them to to talk to each other. So I would define the role, the sales process before you attribute who has the responsibility. I don't know. Does that make exactly exactly? And that allows you to fully optimize your team oh. because you can do whatever you want as an owner and a leader. It's the world's your oyster. Yeah. It's just figuring out what works best and then telling everyone how to go about doing it. And that's yeah. your job. And that's where a lot of leaders want to turned a blind eye to be, be like, oh, it just happens. I don't really know how the bread's made. It's just appears, right? Like you need to know how the bread's made to make sure you're making the best version of bread. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or the cake, the cake's made. Yeah. Uh, well, but they you know, know how the bread's made, but they don't know how it's sold. I don't know what really happens. They just come in, they look at it magically, they decide to buy it. <laughs> yeah, like, that's the best way to build, make a cake. What's the yeah. most efficient way for your team to make a cake? Yeah. Right, tell everyone the ingredients, tell everyone the recipe. Yeah. Don't keep it a secret. Don't just hope the cake turns out you know, make a recipe. Yeah. I like cake. <laughs> I like cake. Oh, that's a soundbite for the show. That's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. And obviously like, you know, coming from my background, you know, cause, and I've seen that in multiple organizations where, um, all that is kind of half done, maybe like organically things move along in an organization, but, uh, operationalizing it, is super important and operation operationalizing it in a way that works for all the parties involved is key. Uh, cause I've, I've spoken with GMs that are like, I have no idea how much money is coming in at the end of the month. Like I have to wait for my our accounting team to send us 
like our our same because he's like, I can see what sales is doing. I know what our new business pipeline looks like, but opportunities are coming left, right, and center. And all of a sudden, like there's a new invoice that gets sent out to a customer for a new project, right? And so that's that's brutal for a company, right? Because I mean, at the end of the day, you need to be able to understand, like in the case that you were giving Alyssa, like most of your business is most probably coming from existing customers. And if you can't forecast that and in turn yeah, optimize seems a little, <laughs> a little dry maybe, but improve that, um, it's going to be critical. And I think that's, that's, that's part that I've, I've seen often neglected as well is just like, Hey, you know, a lot of focus is done on, you know, marketing and selling and making sure we're getting new logos in the door. But once they're there, it's like, yeah, there's a, there's a CS engineering dev team that, that does what they need to do and customers are staying and some are paying more, which is great. Um, but as you were just saying, and like as, you know, countless theorists have said, like it's cheaper to get an, ex you know, it's cheaper to retain a client than to get a new one. Uh, if you're in the SaaS business, like you, most of your money comes in after X number of, yeah. you know, renewals and stuff like that. And so operationalizing it to me is, is critical component. Yeah. Go ahead. Liz. No, no, that's okay. There's also a reality to me. And, and I see this often is that people don't understand what they know about sales. Cause it, it's sort of like it, you, you don't teach someone how to walk. So you think, well, I don't have to teach you how to walk. And some people think sales is the same thing. You're just born with it. You know, you just have it. So often we forget to optimize it, operationalize it, uh, make it logical. I, I, I know a lot of people have CRMs. You know this, Fab, more than anybody else. But a lot of them haven't really sat down and created a sales process. They probably just take what's in the CRM and, and, and leave, the, uh, uh, leave the steps there. And no one outside of sales ever looks at the CRM. So, so, so when that engineer gets called in, you know, fr from an existing client, um, they just, they're shooting from their hip because they know how yeah. to talk and they know their product and, and, and your GM that you're talking about there, Fab, well, okay, well, we'll look at it when the bottom line comes in and they don't realize it. Like you said, a lot of the effort that you put into getting new business, which is good and it's sexy, mm -hmm. it's fancy, it's new, um, is great, but then you're not putting the proper effort in your, with your team to know how to deal with uh, client demands that come in from a separate way. And one thing I want to ask you guys, so, you know, I call myself a sales guy. I know that, but you each run your own businesses. Do you consider yourself salespeople? Yeah. I mean, it's a part of, of what I do for sure. Yeah. So as solopreneurs, we get it right. I'm a salesperson, but I also have to deliver. So I'm also the operations guy, you know, same thing with Alyssa, same thing with you, Fab. But if you really think of your hat, and I know Fab and I, we've had this discussion because many, many years ago, Fab did a sales evaluation and he, this is his words, not mine. He said, I sucked. But you know, <laughs> he's been working at it. He's talked about it. And Fab's realized, well, if I'm going to have my own company, I got to be able to sell my services. So he's worked at it. And so now he's probably one of those operations guys who 10 years ago now understands because he, he had to, to survive, to create a sales process, to understand that. Same thing with you, Alyssa, like when you were in marketing in your previous life, you didn't have to sell, but now you have to sell your services. You, you've evolved, actually you, you've pivoted into a new role. So you need to sell that new pivot, but you, you understand, we all understand what it means to sometimes be a salesperson, sometimes be an operations person. Mm -hmm. But often we're selling as an operations person. Mm -hmm. often the people are coming in at a different level and we're not starting from the intro and we're not giving them a sales pitch. We're doing what we would hope any uh, member of any team in any large corporation would do, which is, you know, ask the right questions, I, the pun not intended, ask the right questions, you know, just see what's going on before and understand the sales process. But we all have sales processes in our businesses and we follow them and we've learned them. And I, I, to me, the way I see this is that in a business, anyone who's forward facing should understand that sales process and where they come in to be able to look at best practices. Wow, George says that? That's really good. I never thought of that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, just this morning I was talking to someone and they were saying, you know, whenever I, I, I close a deal, 
and I ask someone, okay, I've sent you the proposal. We've, we've had, you know, they, they right away, we've talked about this before, Fab, you know, right away I plan, I, I, I book the next step. So we talked about that. So how great would it be, Alyssa, you know, your client, the engineer uh, would know that because he's had that conversation or she's had that conversation with the client and, and you know, they're about to hang up and just a little tiny little thing in the sales process, you know, tiny little anecdote, not anecdote, but a little uh, tactical thing. Well, let's book the next step. So these are all little things that should live in your sales process. You know, and I'm using something very tactical and simple. But this is something that you need to learn and absorb, and you can learn from the best practices, and the best practices end up in your sales process. Well, that was long, long, long. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it goes back to why uh, buyer journey or customer journey mapping is so important because mm. I think of when I when I integrate business operating systems like EOS into clients' businesses one of the primary things we do is create processes but the customer journey fleshes out what that process should look like very easily and then from there we go into building um an accountability chart which is like a an org chart on steroids and once you do that you start to recognize okay what actually is in this engineering role yeah it's a lot of engineering stuff but there's also this one deliverable yeah. to qualify you know new project opportunities with existing clients and that should be part of their responsibility and role and they should be trained and educated and connected to the right material accordingly um the other thing that i wanted to flag too is that existing clients can also change their tune right so they can come back to you with a new project that actually is kind of not in the scope of what's super profitable for you as a business it's it's sort of asking for something that now is not a very good opportunity for you and at one point is that account manager or that engineer able to recognize and flag that so again yeah. it goes back to the training of qualifying yeah. but also not just training but defining as an organization how yeah. you're qualifying your leads we did an exercise a week ago with my one client where we recognize there's only one type of client we actually want. And then we determine mm. all the other nonsense things that we don't want. And that became a type B qualification, a type B prospect, and there was a type A prospect. Yeah. And we determined that the type B prospects, we don't even want to call back. Like there's no point, there's no value in them for us. But for a long time, the sales team was having a list of B's and A's in their to-do list, mm. in their follow-up yeah. list. And we're like, this doesn't make any sense. Um, so defining that will serve the organization really well and making sure those roles and responsibilities are defined across the organization. If there is a sales element to that person's role, it should be recognized and they should be supported and trained accordingly. Yeah, sure. absolutely. And, you know, you talk about the accountability chart. You know, I had the had the pleasure of working with the client that uses the EO method for uh, over nine months. And I found that concept really interesting because the accountability chart then you're not talking about the individual, you're talking about the accountability of the role. And then you can make sure, okay, you know, whatever it is, you know, you're doing this as an engineer. Yes. Boom, 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 boom. But you know, what's, what's the accountability? What's your response? What are your responsibilities when you are dealing with an outside client? And then you can, you can throw it back to, like you just said, the qualification factors of your sales process to make sure that you're dealing with the right people. And, and I think everyone should learn that. And, and it's, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting. Obviously you're preaching to the choir because I, you know, Fab and I believe in this, but it's, it is. Um, and I want to ask you this, uh, particularly you, Alyssa, how have you guys started talking to the engineering team about their responsibilities and sales? Have you, have either one of you done this talk about, uh, sales responsibilities outside of the traditional sales channels? Have, 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 have you had that conversation? Yeah, so that would be the next step. Yeah, so so I haven't done that yet, but I am doing a marketing, business development, and sales workshop with uh, my other client, and they're a um, corporate real estate company or corporate um, mortgage brokers, and they do a lot of new, biz like new um, developments in terms of buildings, corporate, home developments um and they have a number of different agents that are essentially operate as independent business owners but they are laddering up to the brokerage much like the way a real estate agent works um yeah. and so you know at that level they recognize that a lot of their job is sales so we're doing some sales workshopping with them but the next step certainly for this the other client would be for their that particular engineering role that has within its roles and responsibilities yeah. 
that you're you're vetting any new opportunities that come in from existing clients. Um, yeah, that they should be trained accordingly. And then you can recognize too, based on you know, this is how EOS qualifies if you have the right person in the right seat. You figure out then based on the role description if the person that you've slotted into that role um, wants it, has the capacity to do it. Um, and then you can determine if, if they're a good fit for that spot that is an essential linchpin role in your organization. Yeah. Yeah. No, very, very interesting. Um, and it's interesting because I, 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 I actually had the pleasure last year of doing a workshop with, uh, well, I've done two workshops, one with those scientists and one with a client services team. And it was amazing. And it was awesome to see all these people together. It was a, it was a pretty large group and how, when you looked at all of them, the intelligence and the best practices are there. And what you do when you do these workshops is you share. So, oh, wow, these are great pr best practices. There's, there's that creative moment. And then from that creative moment, you optimize, synthesize, and put it into operationalizing and creating that sales process. Because all those, those best practices come in there. Because when you take a group of, what is it, uh, the wisdom of the crowd? When you take when you take a group of uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this is like they, they they've done these tests over years and years they say so they have a huge crowd and everyone guesses the weight of the cow, and usually the weight the average weight comes into much closer to the actual weight of the cow than any one person uh, than most of the people in the group would have guessed it. So it's the same thing when you're doing these these creative group sessions and you have a bunch of engineers together or a bunch of clients, customer services, and you ask them, what should you do in these sales situation? There, there will be wisdom in the crowd. You're taking that, you're putting that together. You're taking the best practices and you're operationalizing that. Sorry, I get I'm very tactical today. But anyway, all that to mm -hmm. say that they, most people have some of that wisdom within them and they don't realize it's sales, you know, cause you'll ask that engineer, Hey, um, you, you'll say, Hey, so, so are, are you in sales? And she'll say, no, I'm not in sales. Well, did you help your client move? Forward? Of course I did. I gave her the right solution. We built the right engine and they ended up buying from us. Oh, but you didn't do the sale. Well, yeah, you're part of that sale. So that's where if you make people aware of this in a large company, then they're much more aware. Oh, I am part of the sales process. I am part of qualifying, but this is a good thing because I'm helping my clients and I'm still doing my job at, at that point. Okay. Another monologue. Sorry. <laughs> uh, too much cost. So. questions. Yeah, you should cut down on the coffee. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, cool. I know. I know you have to leave soon, Paul. So I think it's a it's a, maybe a good moment to to wrap it up. Um, Lisa, what's what what would be your biggest takeaway from from our conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's mapping out that process to see where sales are coming in and who is actually doing sales in your organization first and foremost. So it's clarifying that, and then once you know, you know what your snowflake looks like, then you can start to really uh, improve the functioning of the organization and train your people or better define your roles accordingly so that you are maximizing your sales opportunity at every stage in the organization, in every function of the organization, if it's needed. Cool. You, Paul, biggest takeaway? Well, what, what I would say is, uh, yes, thank you, Fab. Uh, what I would say is, you know, understand that sales process agnostically of the different departments that you're dealing with first. And then make sure that those people, everyone who talks to clients is aware of it. Uh, you know, to elaborate your sales process, obviously you'll need, you know, if, if you're good at it, you can create it yourself. But if not, you can, you know, find someone like us in your neighborhood uh, to help you elaborate it. But it, it's a great, it's a great tool to help you uh, move forward. So do that first, but do it agnostically of any department so that then you can, so it's uh, basically confirming what, what Alyssa said. So. Yes. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, that was great. I mean, for me, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's the operationalization part. I think it's, it's all important, but if, if, if at the end it just stays on documents and, and shared drives somewhere and nobody looks at it, it's not going to get done and it's more importantly, not going to get improved on. And so, so um, true. but it's, it's such a critical part of, of every business. Definitely software, which I work with a lot, but any business, right? Like, as you were talking about engineering and, and manufacturing and, and so on and so forth, uh, repeat business is, is critical and, and it, you do need to take that into account. Uh, it is hot and sexy to find new logos and new clients, and it's exciting to ring the bell 
but um, probably most of the most most of the business is coming in from from people you're already working with, and, and you need to know that and improve on that. Yeah, I would add as a final note too in defining your process. I feel like the exercise is most valuable in actually uncovering the issues in your organization. So when you actually write down what the process is, you tend to pretty quickly see, oh, that's a problem. Oh, that's how mm. it's happening. Oh, that's what's going on. Oh, no, we need to fix that. And that tends to be most often than not what I encounter when doing process actual defining for the first time with clients. Um, mm. It ends up actually being a problem solving initiative more than anything. That's a very good point. You're on fire today, Alyssa. <laughs> I and talk I too much, but you're on any fire. Because I'm putting on my marketing hat, people need to hear things multiple times before they really digest it. So if we just keep Perfect. circling back, saying the same thing together, it's all good. Yeah. Good. All, all right. right. Thanks, Thanks, Alyssa. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Good. Talk to you, Bye. Paul. Talk to you next week. Alyssa, we'll talk to you next month. Yay. Yay. All right. <laughs> Everyone, Everybody. write in and tell Alyssa she needs to move to Montreal. Yes, or at least visit so we can have some lunch and, and drinks and, and do a live podcast. Fab and I did a live podcast uh, a few oh. weeks ago, so that would be fun. Yes. Okay, maybe this winter. Right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>